Okay, so should we get started then? Erin? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Great. Okay, uh, great. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, today is the last lecture of our DeFi class this semester. And thanks everyone for being with us for the whole semester. And I hope everyone has really enjoyed uh, the class and have really learned a lot. And so we are really fortunate uh, to have this uh, special format for the class where we have students from Berkeley as well as students online from all over the world, from over 30 countries. Uh, so it's been a really amazing uh, experience. So uh, in DeFi, uh, in the class, we've covered many different topics. But however, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the class, regulation is a really important topic in DeFi. And so for, for this class, we are really uh, honored uh, to have uh, our guest speaker, Aaron Wright, uh, to give the last lecture of the class on um, regulation, regulatory issues uh, with DeFi. So Aaron is a professor of cortisol law, and he's also the co-founder of Open Law, a commercial operating system for blockchain. Aaron also has a lot of experience with DAOs, and he has also created his own DAO with the Flamingo DAO. Uh, so we are really excited to have him here today as an expert in regulation and law uh, to uh, tell us more about the regulatory issues uh, with DeFi. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Don. Should I, should I kick it off now? It's yes, please. Turn to me. Yes. All right, wonderful. It's nice to meet everybody. Um, I, I heard this is a wonderful uh, class from Don, and uh, I feel like I wish I, I took it in part two. So uh, I I'm, I'm, hope everybody had a great semester. Uh, let me just share my screen real quick. Oop, um, could somebody with host privileges give me access to do that? Okay, great. I think we did. Um, so I'm going to run through regulatory issues with DeFi. I also thought I'd throw in, if we have time at the end, to just talk about some regulatory issues with DAOs because they are they intersect. And I imagine you've talked about that uh, during the, the past couple uh, weeks. Um, so just to, you know, set the table. Um, and please, if there's any questions, you know, just hop in. I'm happy to kind of take this any direction people want to go. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about decentralized finance and, and how it's a fast growing sector in the blockchain economy uh, and ecosystem, you know, at the core. And I think that this is what's the most interesting uh, thing about DeFi is that we're trying to use these smart contract based systems to create uh, financial services or other products uh, that are non custodial in nature. But I think we all know that in uh, that's the aspirational desire, but in practice, uh, you know, many of these services still do rely on different intermediaries, and that's usually where, you know, regulation is going to attach. Uh, so kind of my mental model for uh, DeFi looks something like this, uh, you know, where we have kind of the core base blockchains, and there's regulatory issues related to that. There's all these DeFi protocols that are emerging on top, and that's kind of the core protocols themselves. There's different assets that are being created, whether that's governance tokens or stable coins or some form of a wrapped asset. And then we're seeing kind of this emergence of an aggregation layer between DEX aggregators, asset managers, yield aggregators like Wi-Fi, et cetera. And then there's obviously integration tools, whether that's an Oracle service to kind of extend what the protocol can do, uh, crypto to fiat gateways that may be incorporated in order to onboard new users, um, and uh, although not many platforms do, I imagine over time we'll see KYC and identity solutions starting to get layered in, along with just kind of core token factories, which are um, which are used to either bootstrap or create an asset or or um, interact in some way with the protocol. Um, so regulatory uh, considerations, you know, when you think about regulatory risks, you know, many of these DeFi protocols aim to thin the need for centralized custodians or other central actors. Um, and that, you know, at a high level creates regulatory challenges in the US and in Europe and in most parts of the industrial uh, world when it when you think about financial regulation um, and applying regulation. Um, the law is constructed such that the regulation applies to various different intermediaries in the system, so that could be a bank uh, that could be a custodian that could be a broker or dealer that's dealing in a lot of business, uh, you know that there's a whole host of regulations that apply to different intermediaries, depending on. On what the financial services is provided, 
Uh, you know, same thing if you're a fund of some sort and become, you know, quite large, like you start managing a lot of assets, different rules will kick into effect at different points in time. And so DeFi kind of stands in, in opposition um, to lots of these regulatory approaches where they're looking to, um, you know, they're looking to thin the need for these actors, right? So since our regulations are looking to these types of central intermediaries to apply regulations, and because DeFi is trying to get rid of all those folks, it just uh, likely is going to require a different approach. And that's the friction that you may be hearing if you're paying attention to some of the regulatory conversations. I don't think anybody yet has a really clear grasp on how to regulate DeFi and where the regulation should fall. But I'm hoping just to unpack that a little bit more. Um, but to the extent that DeFi applications implicate a requirement or prohibition under the Commodity Exchange Act or a whole bunch of other uh, related regulations, um, which I'll unpack, you know, these laws are still going to apply. Uh, the core question um, is really this, you know, if something goes wrong with one of these DeFi protocols and somebody gets hurt, who should be liable, right? Um, and we've seen the SEC uh, and the the, the CFTC, which is responsible for the commodities markets or parts of the commodities markets, begin to grapple with these questions in different contexts already. One notable example here is um, the SEC's uh, 21A report. So this is a non-binding uh, report that the SEC put out uh, where it kind of looked at the DAO, uh, the, one of the original experiments um, on Ethereum. So um, there's lots of regulatory concern around DeFi protocols. Um, you know. There's a couple of things that the SEC is currently uh, calling out. And so this came from uh, some statements from Commissioner Crenshaw, um, who talked about DeFi a couple of weeks back. But the two areas where she was at least the most concerned was around a lack of transparency and pseudonymity. So it was a little bit of a head scratcher to me how blockchains, which are public and, um, and pseudonymous, uh, could be um, called out for not being transparent. But I think the concern, at least as she summarized it, is that for many DeFi projects, it creates a two-tier market in which you're having professional investors and insiders reap outsized returns while retail investors take more risks and get worse pricing and are less likely to succeed over time. So that's something that the SEC is worried about. Like, How do we make sure that the marketplaces here are fair? Uh, it's not just dominated by professional investors you know, query how different that is from Wall Street today, right? If you're a professional investor, Wall Street or Wall Street styled investor, you probably have uh, better access to yield or return than a retail investor necessarily would. Uh, they also called out just risks with pseudonymity. Uh, you know, this is a concern not just from the SEC, but other regulators in the US, whether that's the Department of Justice, Treasury, um, the CFTC. You know, the fact that we may not know the identities of certain traders or people that are participating in these markets or the owners of smart contracts, it makes it difficult to ascribe liability if there is liability to ascribe. And it also makes it just uh, difficult to know if the asset prices and trading volumes are organic or some manipulation, right? So, you know, the SEC is a very complex organization, but at its core, it's trying to build, uh, you know, fair marketplaces. Uh, same thing for the CFTC. Uh, other regulators like the like the Treasury and the Department of Justice are really concerned about implementing certain uh, controls uh, that the U.S. have uh, in terms of sanctions or other other type of bad activity that they are hoping to dissuade through you know know your customer or other banking regulations. But the universe of what um, financial laws get implicated by a DeFi protocol, and this is a sliver of it, it's vast, right? So even if um, you know, developers and creators of DeFi projects or other core blockchain technology are able to convince the SEC uh, that the assets that they may have related to their project are not securities, there's still a whole host of laws that get implicated in the commodities bucket, including whether or not a project is an unregistered FCM or DCM SEF. There's anti-fraud provisions, anti-manipulation provisions, commodity pool and commodity trading advisor requirements. Uh, there's unregistered uh, DCOs, um, and then there's supervision type issues. If it if it falls into the securities bucket, there's you know obviously lots of issues that come up, including selling unregistered securities, uh, the trading of securities. Um, if you're interacting with securities or custodying them, there's lots of questions there. And then there's uh, other requirements which fall into more compliance buckets. That includes the Bank Secrecy Act, which is used to implement certain controls uh, related to who 
um, who we're able to interact with globally. Uh, there's OFAC requirements, there's state money transmission laws, there's the bit, the bit license, which is specific to New York. Um, and then there's also just tax and accounting and other types of questions. So it's a big mess and people don't really have the answer. So the, the purpose for the next you know, couple of minutes is really to just think through some buckets of where liability can attach. And hopefully that can inform either something you're developing or something you're interested in. Um, so, you know, one area and one vector where regulation may attach is by imputing direct liability against developers. So, you know, as decentralized finance grows, um, it, it may be difficult to impute liability on the creators of decentralized protocols, um, but it's not off the table. Uh, so in the U.S., software development, at least uh, via courts that have looked at it, they're, they're often a protected activity under the First Amendment. Uh, so if you develop software and you publish it, um, you're protected to do that, right? Um, just like if you were an academic and you were going to create and publish something, the First Amendment gives you the ability to do that. There's some limiting factors there. If there's no lawful purpose for the software, i.e. whatever is getting implemented um, you know, can only be used to violate the law, uh, then you lose that First Amendment protection. You know, we've seen this happen in the past. For example, in the late 1990s, I think that was the 90s, uh, early 1990s, there was a case in the Ninth Circuit, which is the courts that cover California and other parts of the Western part of the United States. They looked at these types of questions in a case involving um, betting software that was being transmitted on floppy disk drives. So really, really fun little fact pattern there for folks that have been uh, developing for quite some time. And, and um, um, there was criminal charges brought against the creators of the software. They raised the First Amendment defense and the circuit court in the Ninth Circuit, which is the higher court, so a court that reviews lower court decisions, uh, looked at it and said, here, because the software had a lawful purpose in the US, I had to facilitate gambling. Uh, the First Amendment couldn't be used as a, as a defense. So there's there are questions here if you are developing DeFi projects, whether or not you'd uh, face some sort of liability, uh, particularly if it's going into an area that is highly regulated to begin with. Um, you know, obviously bringing enforcement actions against developers creates challenges, and that's something regulators look to when they're thinking about where to apply enforcement or where rules should apply. As, as I'm sure everybody in this class knows, you know, once a smart contract-based protocol is deployed, it's difficult to remove it or shut it down right, due to the tamper-resistant nature of a blockchain. Um, so if people want to interact with it and if it's available on a blockchain uh, like Ethereum or another kind of open public and permissionless blockchain, it's, it's going to be hard to prevent people from interacting with it. Um, you know, even if you hold the developers liable, the government in the U.S. is fully aware of this. So the former commissioner of the CFTC, uh, Commissioner Quintens, you know, he noted this way back in 2018, uh, during a speech where he said enforcing CFTC regulations against smart contract developers does not immediately stop the activity from occurring because individual users can continue to use the software. Um, and due to these challenges, the commissioner at the time noted that liability, uh, if uh, the CFTC or SEC was going to explore this, you know, in his view, should only attach if developers could reasonably foresee at the time they create a code that would be likely uh, to be used by US persons in a manner that would violate the CFTC regulations. Uh, so he was proposing, you know, and exploring whether or not uh, it'd be possible uh, to apply liability against developers if they create and implement software, if they could reasonably foresee that it would uh, be used by US persons in a manner violative of, this, of a CFTC regulations. So that could be a direction that the US moves. Uh, I personally hope that that's not the case. I think it's a slippery slope when you start holding developers liable, uh, but I'm not fully convinced that our current regulators agree with that. Another example here is recent guidance from FATF, which is an international organization uh, that's really a collection of different departments of treasury or equivalents in different jurisdictions. Uh, they passed rules related to KYC requirements, and it wasn't that far off from what Commissioner Quintens is saying here that pretty much like you are obligated uh, if states that are part of FATF implement those rules uh, to implement KYC or other AML requirements, if you if it was reasonable that uh, the product or service that you created uh, would require that in, in, in a more traditional context. So this is an area that I think uh, folks, if you are developers should be thinking about um, and just need to be really careful about it. Um, there's, 
other activities uh, adjacent to developing a DeFi uh, protocol that also can create liability. So maybe you create the core smart contracts um, and maybe even a third party deploys them. So you're not responsible for actually bringing uh, kind of the protocol to life. You may face liability if you're maintaining the interface to the underlying smart contracts of the DAP or the front end. If you're maintaining some centralized control over some core mechanic related to how the service operates, uh, potentially, as noted before, even deploying the smart contract itself could create um, liability. And obviously, if you're selling uh, some token related to um, the protocol or project uh, or giving away uh, some token related to the project um, or system, you may face uh, some sort of securities related issues. So let me just highlight a couple cases where the SEC uh, uh, has kind of weighed in here already. Uh, one is this matter, it's called in the matter of Zachary Coburn. Uh, Zachary put together a early DEX called Delta Exchange and um, he was found liable and penalized uh, you know, for a whole bunch of different reasons. But the core ones, if you kind of read the decision was that he deployed the underlying smart contract. He maintained the website that users access to interact with the smart contracts. And then, um, you know, he basically was running um, a list of who, uh, of which assets could trade through the service. And that just those like little points of, of, of control. So deploying the contracts, maintaining the front end and selecting the tokens available for trading uh, resulted in liability. Uh, and that's a big deal, right? If you're found liable, for violating securities laws, it's going to be a huge pain in the butt. Um, you're going to have to hire lawyers. You're going to have to uh, provide information. You can face penalties. And then the most extreme example, and it's not often used, you could also face some criminal liability. Um, that's what's being alleged against uh, one of the developers, the CTO of BitMEX, if, if folks are familiar with that project. Um, the SEC has also weighed in on DeFi recently. So this came down in August. Uh, in a case called In the Matter of Blockchain Credit Partners. Uh, they held a money market DeFi platform, um, which was referred to as DMM, and its founders liable for offering and selling unregistered securities, i.e. governance token and fraud. Uh, so in many ways, this is similar to some of the issues we saw with an ICO. Uh, the developers in this instance paid uh, digital asset trading platforms to list their tokens. They bought and sold uh, their tokens on these platforms. They solicited prospective investors uh, by describing the DeFi uh, project as a profitable business backed by real world uh, assets. They touted the DeFi protocol as a way for investors to earn consistent return or a yield of 6.2%. Um, they did a, a sale of tokens and raised something like $17.7 .7 million and subsequently misrepresented you know, how the raised funds were used. And then they didn't limit the purchases of these tokens to accredit investors or perform KYC. So obviously, and I don't know the folks behind DM, DMM, but they were not, uh, it didn't seem like trying to do things above, bur, uh, above board. So this kind of mix of activity gives you a sense of what regulators are, are, are unhappy about. So if, you're, if your DeFi project has a token in some sort of way, um, you can run into issues if you're selling them, distributing them in, in some capacity. And it didn't matter. And this is expressed in the, in the, um, in the, a cease and desist uh, order that came out of the SEC. The SEC regulators, they don't care what label you put on it. If you call it a governance token, you called it you know, a duck token, they don't really care what it's called uh, as long as it is presented to the public as an investment making scheme in some capacity. Um, that's gonna raise securities laws issues. And then obviously actively participating and supporting these platforms uh, by trying to list it as uh, something that's tradable uh, by participating in the markets, um, you know, by uh, pilfering funds. Those are things that, you know, reasonable folks inside the government are, are not going to like. Um, so the SEC has not yet weighed in further when it comes to DeFi projects, although my understanding is that there's about 60 plus requests for information to various different DeFi projects um, in the U.S. Um, and there's investigations that are ongoing. Uh, so I think what we'll see at the end of the day is more color around governance tokens and in what instances they can be distributed uh, and possibly sold. Uh, I also think we'll get more color as to what the direct liability will be for developers um, if they've deployed smart contract based systems. 
Um, so in addition to direct liability, other things to be concerned about are theories of secondary liability. So what this means is even if you weren't uh, directly a developer, if you're somehow participating in some sort of way or interacting with some of these DeFi protocols, it may raise some liability for you. Um, and there may be ways for the government um, or government regulators to hold uh, other participants. So uh, outside of the software developers, the individuals or teams that are doing that, uh, liable for secondary or vicarious liability. Um, and there's a couple of legal theories that they can do this under. One is aiding and abetting liability, and the second one is controlling person liability. Um, so here's an example from the Commodity Exchange Act where it makes, uh, makes it uh, possible for somebody to get in trouble if, if that person commits uh, or, or willfully aids, abets, counsels, commands, induces, or procures the commission of any violation of any provision or chapter uh, in the rules. So it's super broad. Um, and so that means that uh, if you're in some way interacting, um, you know, interacting with various different uh, DeFi projects, you could run into some issues and I'll unpack that a little bit more. Uh, and this has been used in the past. So here's an example from the CFTC, uh, which they brought against a company called Edgefin Financial Tech. So this is not a crypto project, uh, but it had uh, you know, some folks that were involved in a spoofing scam and they were held liable under these theories. So uh, the CFTC and the SEC, they don't often uh, enforce under these theories, but my sense is they will increasingly do that. So who does this create issues for? Uh, if you're building a DeFi aggregator, you could arguably aid and abet unlawful transactions, let's say securities transactions or commodities transactions. If you're providing liquidity at the um, you know, in various different AMMs, that means you're directly participating and possibly disproportionately facilitating unlawful behavior. Uh, you're acting like a market maker and that could raise uh, liability. If, if you have a controlling interest in a governance token, you could potentially be liable. So uh, let's say you're an investment fund and you own 20, 30, 40% of a governance token or some, you know, significant amount and can sway control over uh, how the protocol develops, you may be liable. If you're a multi-sig holder on, uh, in a DeFi DAO and you're effectuating transactions, then you may have the ability to control unlawful activity. Um, that was the thin liability that, um, that the SEC flagged with the DAO itself. There was a, a small group of curators, uh, I think that's what they were called, uh, who just really like made sure that you know, all the information in the original DAO's application was accurate and they were called out as being potentially liable um, for participating uh, in the DAO. And then obviously, you know, you could conceivably make the argument that validators or miners uh, could be responsible. I, I think those types of arguments wouldn't work, but it's at least possible. Um, it's still unclear if government regulators will apply these uh, theories of secondary liability. Um, they don't really deter or stop the use of a, a DeFi protocol uh, for much the same reason. Um, secondary liability uh, will encourage developers to use either more advanced forms of crypto to obscure transactional records or uh, try to make the technology even harder to regulate. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of enforcement costs to bring secondary liability cases. You don't have to just bring it against an individual team or a set of developers. You have to find the people that are participating um, and they're a bit harder to prove and, and a little bit more costly. Um, and then the last piece, obviously, if you're going after a whole bunch of miners or validators or different participants in the network, you're, you're just going to preclude people in that jurisdiction from, uh, from working on these types of systems, and that could, could deter uh, innovation or push innovation to other parts of the globe. All right. Uh, so one potential solution that people have been kicking around to some of these issues. Um, so assuming that there's going to be some form of direct liability against software developers and assuming that um, that there'll be some forms of secondary liability that kind of emerge after this enforcement wave uh, continues could be to develop a safe harbor of some sort. Uh, so the idea would be to, to give software developers or other DeFi participants uh, some degree of flexibility to develop what they're doing if there's a lawful purpose to what they're doing, if there's no fraud, uh, possibly if they bake in, you know, some sort of compliance. So I wouldn't be surprised if in three, four or five years, particularly in DeFi, if it looks like something like this, where you're going to have to make sure it, it's blocking OFAC uh, barred uh, countries or addresses or individuals. Um, and, you know, whatever you're developing, 
you know, does have at least some lawful purpose to it. It, it, it. You know, like Uniswap would be a good example. Uniswap has lawful purposes to trade a whole bunch of different tokens. Some of those tokens may be uh, security, some may not. Uh, if it was only used to trade securities, then uh, it has no lawful purpose. And maybe it's a it's uh, an exchange that um, should have been registered or, or something along those lines. I also think to go back to making sure that the markets are fair and safe for retail uh, customers and consumers, I wouldn't be surprised if you see some restrictions on margin trading occurring. Uh, conceivably, this is more future leaning uh, area of my research. You could imagine also, um, you know, either CFTC or SEC software systems you know, using code based systems to enforce some laws, that'd be pretty cool. It's a concept that I call code as law. Um, the reason I think this may be the path is really uh, drawing from an analogy from the copyright wars that occurred in the 1990s. Um, you know, we saw with the first wave of the internet, copyright laws evolve uh, via the common law or courts uh, to grapple with the challenges with peer to peer music uh, file sharing systems. Uh, what happened uh, over a 20-year period is that we saw an expansion in theories of secondary copyright liability and the introduction of various safe harbors. Uh, so just to give you a sense of this, if you, haven't, um, if you don't know this area of the law, through various decisions at both the Supreme Court, the highest court in the U.S., and different circuit courts, kind of the tier below the, the Supreme Court, a vicarious or secondary liability is now imputed on online platforms if they exercise requisite control over copyright infringement or they receive a financial benefit. Um, requisite control has been determined to be a, a legal right to stop or limit directly infringing conduct, as well as the practical ability to do so. So you, you can kind of see something like this being implemented here, right? If Uniswap, and not to pick on Uniswap, just release the smart contracts, uh, they may not have rec requisite control, but the moment that they're running the front end, well, they kind of do, right? They could implement additional code to stop or limit uh, some activity that could be concerning. Uh, so maybe they'd be liable, uh, you know, kind of under that theory. And critically, at least in the copyright context, this type of liability attaches even if they lack knowledge of the infringement here, right? So going back to the Uniswap example, even if Uniswap didn't know directly that there were certain tokens being traded on their platform, like specifically know that that was a security and specifically know that it was being traded, um, it wouldn't matter. They could still be found liable. Uh, there's also a secondary, uh, a second uh, theory uh, called contributory liability, and that's been imputed through theories of inducement. Uh, so those are situations where online platforms intentionally encourage copyright infringement. So you could see that working here too. If you're inducing people to violate the law, some financial law, uh, through your statements, words, actions, etc., cetera, uh, then you know, there's some logic to holding that person responsible. And so contributory liability attached to things like Grokster and some early peer-to-peer um, -peer networks uh, after N Napster. At the same time, at least in the US, we saw a whole bunch of safe harbors get implemented in, via treaty and via direct action from Congress. The most notable ones, the DMCA, you may be familiar with it. And this is what enables wonderful platforms like Wikipedia and larger Web2 platforms like YouTube and Spotify to operate. Uh, basically, those uh, services are not liable if they implement this notice and takedown regime where copyright holders can ask to have their information taken down. Um, so I, I think what many lawyers and academics and other policymakers that are looking at this, they're trying to find the right kind of safe harbor for it. But I think this model kind of makes sense. Um, like if it was my idealized world, I would try to protect uh, developers from any liability. I think that's unfair uh, and would really uh, deter innovation. Uh, look for people that are really actively profiting or, or contributing to some sort of uh, violation and then hopefully providing the well-intentioned actors you know, a bit of safe harbor so that they can do what they're, what they're doing. Um, yes, so, so that kind of just sums up. Yeah, I think DeFi could be regulated using theories of secondary liability under the Commodities Exchange Act and other acts. Um, and I think at, this, at the same time, it could be used for responsible development to protect consumers' interests without necessarily limiting innovation. So hopefully we get to kind of that point. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there. I don't know if anybody has any questions or about what was just presented. I'm happy to stop and then I could dive into some DAO-related matters. Any questions? All right. Hey, Dom, be before, um, before I dive into this, have you spoken about DAOs at a high level? 
in the class? We've uh, right, we've talked about it at a very high level. Uh, it'll be good if you can right, introduce uh, really okay. what that means. Right, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so let's just talk about DAOs, DAOs for a second. I think this has been gleaned from the class, right? But in, you know, many people claim that blockchains are right undisputed chains of truth. That's an overstatement, but I like this animated GIF. Um, they're definitely efficient, secure. Query whether or not they're less costly, but just assume that they are at least over time. Um, and they do enable different forms of digital voting. Um, you know, using tokens or different information that can get stored in a blockchain or some off-chain solution. Um, you can begin to see glimmers of, of uh, digital voting schemes. They may not be appropriate for things like public votes, like voting for a president or uh, like a, a, a global or jurisdiction leader, uh, but they can work for areas where privacy is less of a concern. Um, and we, we started to see over the past, um, the past year plus in particular, just more and more activity uh, related to kind of combining uh, the powerful ability of uh, blockchain and other crypto projects to pool assets, to begin to manage assets in more complex DeFi systems, and then adding in this digital voting component to start to erect DAOs, right? And you can use this kind of an anchor for voting weight, either an ERC-20, you could conceivably use like an NFT too. I think we'll see a lot more of that over the, uh, the, the next couple of years. Um, but that, that kind of combination has kind of led to more uh, fervor around DAOs. Uh, so at a high level, right, blockchains are not just useful to settle transactions, but they can also be used to coordinate activity. Uh, the primary way that this is manifested thus far is with DAOs, right, or decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, the concept of a DAO and the, the phrase DAO is a bit of a misnomer, uh, and hopefully I can unpack that a little bit more. But at a high level, you know, I think the idea is that blockchains and smart contracts are more efficient than what we have today. And because of these efficiencies and because there's more information available on a blockchain and, and more generally over the internet, we can hopefully create more transparent organizations and organizations that are less hierarchical in nature. Uh, so organizations that are using hard to modify software, i.e. smart contracts to prevent people from stealing pooled assets, uh, thereby creating trust or giving people the ability to use smart contracts or smart contract and voting based systems to begin to manage those assets in a, in a more decentralized way. Um, so the idea, again, use some blockchain-based voting mechanism to enable people to rapidly provide judgment, sentiment, or governance. Um, hopefully, you can do that um, in a way that builds a, quote, he headless organization or organization that's not run by a smaller group of people, a board or a fixed set of managers. Um, and then maybe over the longer run, and this is more fu uh, future-leaning, maybe you could even imagine more algorithmic organizations, right? So organizations where there's no humans involved, just like a core algorithm at, uh, at its base. I don't think we're there yet. Although, we're, you know, there's some interesting art projects that are getting kind of close to that, like Bato. Uh, so one schema that I, I kind of use to mental model DAOs is a little bit like this. There's more algorithmic DAOs where there's kind of like a core set of code at the center. You know, some people have argued that Bitcoin and Ethereum and other blockchain uh, projects and protocols would be like this. Uh, there's arguably like some very simple smart contract based systems that are DAO like where the smart contracts are not upgradable. I think we'll see more of that. And then there's a whole other category that people call decentralized organizations. I've been increasingly referring to them as participatory DAOs. So these are DAOs where people are weighing in um, to determine the future of a group or a set of smart contract um, uh, based protocols. Right. Um, and that's why we're seeing DAOs kind of take root in. DeFi, I think a lot of projects, either due to regulatory reasons or because they just think it's a great way to manage um, the development of the core smart contracts that they developed, are relying on more decentralized forms of governance to manage that. Um, and then we're also seeing kind of for-profit DAOs. Some of the DAOs that I pulled together are more focused on this, and they're really trying to pool capital and make a profit kind of collectively with a group. Uh, so DAOs, if you're not familiar with them, um, they, there's been an evolution of them. Uh, the first kind of substantive DAO was the DAO itself. Uh, and that launched in you know, mid-2016. It was kind of the first great experiment on Ethereum. And it was pretty much fashioned as a venture capital fund. So people pooled capital. And the idea was people could democratically vote on which projects uh, would receive capital. And it would create a flywheel for Ethereum, right? Where good projects would get identified by the community, where the members of the DAO, they would get uh, the capital that they needed to develop things. And then hopefully, um, you know, that would um, 
that would kind of create a flywheel of innovation in the Ethereum ecosystem. Unfortunately, due to the some technical um, uh, bugs um, and uh, a hack attack or theft, it's still unclear exactly what happened. The DAO was a glorious failure, uh, but at the time, I think it raised something like 150-ish million dollars worth of ether, which today would be worth a in, in incredible amount. Um, and then, obviously, people began to get excited and interested in this core concept, and we saw the SEC weigh in on uh, some of the regulatory requirements related to it. Uh, after the DAO, uh, particularly the Ethereum ecosystem, there was developers that were kicking around and trying to build more stuff. Uh, but really, the rebirth of DAOs started with a, a set of smart contracts called the Molok DAO smart contracts. Uh, it was a grant giving DAO that was uh, uh, that used just a simplified design um, and tried to address some of the shortcomings in the orig original DAO um, setup and construction. And it worked pretty well. It pulled together a couple million dollars worth of assets, and it was able to give grants to parties. And uh, it seemed like it was it was operating pretty effectively. Um, and since that time, and this is from even a couple months months back, I think it's crossed over um, several billion dollars in assets and several hundred thousand participants. We've just kind of seen an explosion in the number of people that are participating and interacting with DAOs. Uh, if you went back to February of last year, so February 2020, um, I think there was about $10 million in DAOs and I, uh, $10 million, let me go back, February 2019, so I guess two years ago, there's about $10 million in DAOs, probably like 6,000 users. Uh, if you go to deepdao.io, and it's hard to get the best data on this, but it's it's growing really fast and showing kind of hyperbolic growth similar to, um, to DeFi. Um, a way if that was a little bit too high level for you that I've been thinking about DAOs is it's a basically a, a way to arm a Reddit community with a bank account. So a way to have an online community that has a shared bank account or some shared assets, pooled assets, and they can do things together. Uh, it's not just me that's thinking about this. If you paid attention to Wall Street Bets, you know that's something that they even noted that like the similar mechanics to what we saw with Wall Street Bets. I think lots of folks are interested with DAOs. A um, couple other examples of this are things I've worked on, uh, like the Lao and Flamingo, where it really is just a, kind of a reboot of the DAO itself. People pulling together assets and trying to make a, a profit. Okay, so DAOs and DeFi. So you know, DAOs are playing in a pretty outsized role when it comes to DeFi for the reasons I mentioned before, uh, developers due to regulatory uh, reasons are trying to decentralize themselves. So they're trying to step away from a project and really giving control of that uh, to the community. Um, you know, Some folks are doing that uh, because they think that limits their potential liability, either direct or secondary liability, um, number one, or number two, uh, they just think it's a smart way to run open source software, right? It, you should have a whole bunch of stakeholders, a whole bunch of people participating to make sure that you have a healthy ecosystem that's well supported. So in my mind, um, in the purest sense, I do think that these DeFi DAOs are in effect an evolution of software foundations and they're using governance tokens, again, in the most optimistic view to enable holders to vote and really weigh in on how these systems should operate. Um, you know, for DeFi related DAOs, uh, token holders often vote on key parameters that are necessary and need to be set in those systems, or they help decide how the smart contract should operate or evolve. They help handle other kind of matters. Um, and there's lots of decision-making that's occurring in these groups. And sometimes they can even be used to upgrade how the smart contract-based software operates. The, the piping between a vote and like the actual upgrade is not that great yet. Uh, it's often still done manually by the, by the, um, the DeFi uh, projects, original software developers, which is a bit of a concern, but I imagine over time, they'll get a little bit uh, tighter in coupling. Uh, so we've seen a whole bunch of DAOs emerge. Uh, many of you have, may be owners of these assets and participate in these communities. So everything from Compound and Aave and Uniswap and Balancer, Maker, Synthetics, Sushi, they're all kind of leaning into using these DAO-based models. Plenty of practical issues with DAOs uh, today. Um, the tooling is not that great. Uh, lots of work needs to be done to make it better. Uh, it's pretty expensive to, to still administer and really do anything as a group online uh, or a group on chain, uh, mostly due to cost. So recording votes, uh, triggering you know smart contracts after a vote, it's still pretty costly. So there's lots of work that still needs to be done there. Um, and then there's obviously uh, some legal uncertainty. So let me unpack that a bit more. Uh, so what are the legal issues with DAOs? There's classifications of the DAOs themselves. Like what are these things? Uh, like what channel or bucket do they fit in under existing legal regimes? 
And then there's always questions about the interest, right? So what are governance tokens? If the DAO has a governance token, if it doesn't, uh, what are the interests or the, you know, whatever rights that a member may have in the DAO itself? Um, the headline and something to take away, you know, you can call yourself a DAO, but legally, if you're aiming to make a profit of some sort, you're likely going to be classified in the US and most of Europe and frankly, most of the globe as a general partnership. Uh, so the way that that law works is uh, you don't have to do anything. And due to various different statutes that have been applied, they can or that have been enacted, your activity can be characterized as a partnership, even if you didn't file any paperwork, even if you took no further steps. And there's plenty of areas of law where things are implied onto you. And so if you're trying to make a profit and working with other people together, um, you're, you're likely to run into these partnership related questions. And um, if you don't formalize that relationship in some sort of way through a contract or an operating agreement or some written document, then these default rules apply and they have some gnarly side effects. One is uh, whatever you do inside of a partnership, you are liable for. Um, so if something goes wrong, let's say the SEC find uh, a DAO, $100 million, each member would individually be liable for that $100, $100 million. Um, so if you're a deep pocket, you have a lot of funds, you may be on the hook to pay that entire um, penalty. And then you'll have to turn to your other DAO members in order to recover, uh, to recover assets. Um, so it, it can run into some really difficult problems if something goes bad for people that have deep pockets. And that's why we've created things like corporations and LLCs. They provide a limitation of liability in most instances, and your liability is limited to any uh, assets that you've contributed to that organization. Right, your stock, or if you if you've actively contributed assets, then it would be limited to the assets you contributed, and that's a good thing. You know that enables us to kind of segregate risk and take bigger risks. Um, so uh, partnerships are are wonderful in many ways, but this lack of limitation of liability creates some challenges uh, for larger folks to participate in DAOs. There's a second concept in the law called the fiduciary duty. Uh, fiduciary duty is a fancy legal term for some super special rights, so some additional rights. Uh, so if you're a member of a DAO that's uh, characterized as a general partnership, you pretty much owe all the other members of the DAO um, fiduciary duties, uh, i.e. special rights. And what that means is that you can't uh, do things to hurt the other people. You can uh, potentially uh, use information for your own benefit or try to usurp opportunities for the DAO. There's lots of implied duties that come when you're a fiduciary. Um, and that may be implied in a DAO itself. What does that mean in practice? Like, again, if something goes bad and you're in a DAO uh, and you did something that, um, you know, may have been a little unsavory, well, you may have violated your fiduciary duties and you could be liable to the other members of the DAO, which would be problematic. Um, and because of the lack of limitation of liability and because of these implied fiduciary duties, there's lots of rights that members have against other members and that could just lead to really nasty, naughty situations. Uh, so people have been thinking about this for quite some time. You know, even before Ethereum launched, there were some events that I was fortunate enough to participate in at MIT and other places where we were starting to think about this. Like, oh, probably want some sort of limited li liability. Um, some of those issues that I just described were probably not the best. Um, you know, is there any any solution, right? Any way that we could fix this? And so one concept that's getting operationalized is uh, potentially housing a DAO in a limited liability entity or an LLC. Um, that's why in part we called the Lao the Lao. We were experimenting with it. Um, if you kind of anchor a DAO in a limited liability uh, entity like an LLC, you can waive these fiduciary duties. You can define how the DAO will operate and legally defer to these code-based systems. And by doing that, you just avoid some of these issues and kind of manage the operational risk. You make it a little bit safer for larger enterprises to participate. Uh, this approach has gained some headwind in different states in the US, Vermont, uh, kind of took this approach several years back when they implemented the BB LLC or the blockchain-based LLC. Uh, Wyoming uh, recently acknowledged that you could set up an entity called a DAO as a, a subpart of the LLC Act, um, which just makes it a little bit cheaper if you're uh, going through this wrapped LLC uh, approach to, to set one of these things up. It is not a perfect solution and probably doesn't work all that well for DeFi DAOs, but it's a, it's a start. Um, Another potential solution, this is something I've also implemented through a project called Museo, is an unincorporated not-for-profit. So if you really do view a DeFi 
project or a DAO related to AT5 project as a, you know, as a modern riff on a software foundation, well, it may not have a, pro a for-profit pur purpose. It may actually be like a software foundation, right? Just uh, a way for people to convene and weigh in on governance and possibly, you know, collect enough funds to, to, um, to begin to support development of the ecosystem, et cetera. Um, this is a structure that's unique to the U.S. It's pretty much the converse of a partnership. If, uh, if you're not uh, trying to make a profit and you haven't filed any paperwork, you can be characterized as unincorporated not-for-profit. Uh, the nice thing about an unincorporated not-for-profit is you don't have to file anything with the state in order to become one. And you can use this structure to waive fiduciary duties, potentially with a separate contract limit liability, and it also contemplates transferable governance rights. So it feels like a promising structure for DeFi DAOs, right? If they're not intending to distribute assets back to token holders, they really only have a token that's a, a governance token in some sort of way. And then there's the other issue, uh, which is always what the heck are these DAO interests, right? This is again, similar to issues with ICOs in the matter I described previously. You know, if you have a DeFi project and you have a governance token, and that governance token gives you the right to participate in the DAO, what the heck is that thing, right? Um, why are people acquiring it? How is it acquired? And that's going to be governed by a test in the US called the Howey test primarily. So this is a three or four part test. You may have heard of it. It involves the investment of money in a common enterprise, which relies on the efforts of others with an expectation of profit. Um, so, you know, one concept, and this is why I think we've seen DeFi projects move towards DAOs is they're trying to basically say, um, if a token's introduced, that people are not relying on the efforts of the software developers that created it. Instead, they're relying on their own efforts or the efforts of a kind of distributed decentralized network. Uh, unclear, like uh, what the boundaries are of that thought exercise. Uh, that's possibly going to be something that people agree with uh, in regulatory bodies, although I'm a little less convinced. Um, and then obviously the expectation of profit piece is a, is is really calibrated by how you're presenting this token to the market. Um, if you're selling it, if you're promising that it's going to be a profitable enterprise and the token's going to go up in value, uh, then likely the SEC is going to consider that a security. Um, so lots of gray areas with DAOs and what, what their interests are. Um, you know, there's an argument that if the interest in a DAO is more like a member managed partnership interest or an interest in a not-for-profit where each member has control over the, the DAO, ownership is evenly distributed and information is freely available. It probably shouldn't be considered a security, at least in my view, uh, but ultimately that's up to the courts. Um, and the argument, there's arguments that these interests are not securities. Um, and there, are, there is a, a raft of case, case law to support this or cases that support this position, but there's nothing like firm and binding, something just what lawyers would call dispositive. So I think we'll see a little bit more uh, conversations around that. Uh, also, because DAOs, DeFi's, and NFTs, they're all kind of blending together. Uh, there's also gray areas if there's an initial sale of NFTs and it evolves into a DAO in some sort of way. Um, or let's say a, a, a protocol is launched and then uh, the NFTs are uh, either NFTs are airdropped on onto different people for governance purposes or tokens are, whether that, um, you know, whether that's going to be considered a, um, a security in some sort of way. Um, see your question, Matt. Let me just finish this up because I think this is this is the end. Um, yeah, and I think the headline, and then I'll turn over to a couple questions. Is really there's a lot of gray area when it comes to DeFi uh, and regulation, but there's enough people that are, you know, somehow supporting, interacting, developing these systems that uh, clever regulators will be able to find liability if they feel like somebody's been hurt, uh, and that's probably a good thing, right? Like if somebody's a real, um, you know, fraudster, huckster, somebody that's not well-intentioned and is hurting people, we probably want to hold them responsible. The tricky part is like, how do you calibrate this in the right way so that you don't uh, hurt the well-intentioned actors that are just trying to build new, lower cost, more autonomous systems that, that hopefully would improve the lives of others. Uh, so that is what I was hoping to cover. Maybe I'll open it up to some questions. Matt, Matthew, I see your question. Uh, attempts. So Matt's question, if you haven't seen it, is uh, aren't attempts to regulate DeFi sort of just pushing it back towards the centralized finance world? Isn't it? Uh, isn't an intrinsic part of DeFi that it's unregulated? 
Um, I mean, it is regulated. Whether or not the regulation is enforced is a separate question. I think, I think that that's like a nice tweet to say that DeFi is not regulated, but in practice, the law doesn't evaporate just because you've sprinkled magic blockchain words onto whatever you're doing. Um, you know, if your activity falls into a regulated area, then you need to be regulated, right? Um, whether or not the government or private party chooses to enforce is a whole separate question. But I do think it's a good point, Matt, um, Matt or Matthew. You know, if they start uh, implementing similar rules to what what uh, are applied today, you're just going to recreate the same system, right? You're going to force centralization around exchanges. You're going to force centralization around different products or services, and it's going to look pretty much the same as what we have today. And a lot of the efficiencies that people are have already achieved or are aspiring to achieve may not be um, may not be recognized or, or realized, which is which would be unfortunate. Anybody else have any questions? I know we went through a whole bunch of different things. Uh, yes, Erin. Yeah, thank thank you so much for an amazing lecture. Uh, so uh, I think okay. So someone else posted another question here. Oh, cool. Uh, let me just go back. How can existing uh, round incorporation be expected? Ah, so DAO members, I mean, they're not anonymous, right? Uh, so everybody's a pseudonym. And I think, and I don't know if you've covered this in the class, I'm assuming so, but, you know, through transaction graph analysis or other kind of data, um, data analytics tools, you're able to identify people and increasingly do that. Um, so the possibility that you'd have like a purely anonymous group of people in DAOs, it's conceivable, right? Like we've seen great projects like Tornado Cash and other kind of more advanced um, smart contract-based, um, zero knowledge-based uh, privacy solutions emerge. They're still pretty clunky and costly and they're not perfect, but maybe they get better over time. So it's more anonymous. Um, so I just question almost the premise there uh, in part, right? Like you're, you're not, going to be able to hide your, your tracks fully. Uh, in Delaware, at least, if you're setting up like a wrap DAO, uh, you need as an entity to keep track of, um, of who the members are if there's a question from law enforcement. Uh, the way that we've handled that in the Lao and Flamingo and the, I think, nine other DAOs that we, we've created, um, my a company that I run uh, Tribute Labs, we serve as a service provider. So the DAO members provide us with the information and then we're obligated not to share that uh, with other members of the DAO so people can operate as pseudonyms. So in like the Lao, Flamingo, Neptune, the whole host of the other DAOs we, we built, we have people that operate as pseudonyms. You know, nobody goes on video uh, on calls and people go by handles and only if they want to kind of uh, reveal themselves or dox themselves, they'll, they're able to do that. So I do think you're you will see DAOs where there's pseudonyms that are able to uh, participate, at least in Delaware that presents some challenges if you wanna do a wrap DAO. Um, if you're going in other states, it may not be required, uh, although it could be sensible to do that. And then obviously if you're just doing like a more open-ended uh, DeFi based DAO, plenty of people are synonymous or, or uh, are able to use enough privacy preserving technology to, to basically become anonymous. And there's not much you can do about that. Um, it becomes really an enforcement question. Um, okay, another question from an anonymous attendee who obviously wants to operate as a pseudonym. If a smart contract is popular, but its operator is not known and does something bad to its users in certain cases, would regulation deal with something like that? Yeah, I mean, well, first query whether or not um, the operator couldn't be identified. So let's just not to pick on Sushi, but like, let's say Sushi Swap. It you know was purportedly uh, you know created by a pseudonym. I'm not fully convinced if you if you put a little law enforcement efforts that they couldn't identify who that person was, especially if they're working with some of these analytics companies. Uh, but let's assume that they are not able to do that. What likely will happen is anybody that is still supporting that project in some sort of way could face some liability, right? So um, if you're you know one of the core contributors to it, if you're um, really participating heavily in building the markets and marketplaces around sushi, then you may face some sort of liability. Those are harder cases. It's hard to know what, what people would do, but uh, the headline I think I'd say is there's always like a little bit of um, a hook that people that want to you know, go after a project can find if they're creative enough. 
So hopefully that answered that, Mr. Anonymous or Ms. Ms. Anonymous or however you want to identify. All right, Andrew, um, do you have any insight into what makes a healthy data decision-making process, maybe concepts from political science, like being predictable, making decisions in public through deliberation, et cetera? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I can only tell you about what uh, we are doing in some of the DAOs that uh, we support. So we support nine DAOs. There's been about $200 million worth of Ether contributed to the DAOs. The, they're really focused on making uh, investments decisions together. So you can kind of lump them in the fund of like a venture capital or hedge uh, type fund. And what we're seeing work really well is operating via rough consensus as opposed to quorum based voting. I think a lot of DeFi DAOs uh, are not. Uh, as effective as they can be because they rely on quorum-based business uh, decisions. So they, they require certain thresholds to propose things. They need certain thresholds to be met for something to get implemented. And what happens is that those thresholds are oftentimes not reached and nothing happens. Uh, we've taken a different approach in our DAOs where we operate via rough consensus. And this is really inspired by the design of the Moloch DAO smart contract system. The way it works there is that if uh, there's a proposal, somebody else can sponsor it. So you kind of have a second uh, so it's a little bit like a parliamentary system. And then once it's sponsored, it goes up for vote uh, and a window of time opens up. In the Malik DAO, it's a default seven-day period, although it can be calibrated. And if during that period, there's more yes votes than no votes, then it passes. And then the, you know, the, the assets will be moved or they could be claimed by a third party uh, or you could trigger you know, a smart contract um, after that voting period, et cetera. Um, and what's notable about that is that it just operates with a very subtle difference. It's not saying enough people need to weigh in, just the people that are paying attention during that period of time weigh in. And there's kind of a default to action that occurs from that. And that seemed to work really well. Like across those nine DAOs, I think we've deployed uh, well over $100 million in capital, per, like backed 100 plus projects, purchased like several thousand NFTs. So you can move pretty quick with this like rough consensus model. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. The other thing that we've learned through the DAOs is you probably need a, some support um, just to kind of push things along, like almost like a whip in Congress or a mod on a subreddit, right? Somebody to just kind of clean the streets, push things forward if there's something that needs to be done and handle a bit of the scut and grunt work. Uh, just doing that, I think, has been helpful to, to kind of make governance a little bit easier and uh, have a healthy decision-making process. Lots of DAOs will do like some soft polling or straw polling before they put something up for formal vote just to see if there's rough consensus. We definitely do that. I think lots of DeFi DAOs do that. That's probably makes a bunch of sense. Um, so I those are our early lessons from it, like how to make a healthy DAO decision-making process. Um, I think the last piece that we do in our DAOs is people congregate in different channels that can include like Discord, but we also have weekly calls that are that people can just join and just like either shoot the breeze or talk through whatever topics people want to talk through. And that's been really helpful to, to kind of build some soft cohesion and get a group of people that are kind of focused to push things along. Uh, other people are experimenting with kind of creating subcommittees or like streams or pods or smaller groups. I'm a little skeptical about that, both from a regulatory reason. I think if you're part of like a smaller group, you're probably opening yourself up to liability, number one. And number two, I'm just not fully convinced that will work that well, but time will tell. I guess it depends on the scot, the the scope of the DAO. Uh, but I I think what I find most exciting about DAOs at a high level is it really is like a petri dish to explore these new concepts, um, and I think that that is exciting. And because we have these new efficient tools, I smart contracts and blockchain technology we can start to play around, right? And people have really been theorizing and coming up with really interesting voting mechanics and concepts from delegated voting to conviction voting to different waiting on voting to make decisions. And I, my sense is at the end of the day, like probably you're gonna see a mix of, of different DAO decision-making processes depending on, the, de depending on the process. So I'll give an example there. We run a DeFi DAO called Neptune um, where we have um, a bucket of ether that's allocated for fast moving opportunities where um, it goes forward if nobody vetoes it. Um, and then there's uh, slower buckets to do things like what we would call like a beta strategy or deploying it into you know a fair amount of ether into let's say like compound or, or 
or Ave or something like that. So I think you're going to have kind of blended decision-making processes. I guess last thing on that point, I do think these multi-token models are pretty interesting and something we'll hear a lot more about where you can begin to introduce kind of um, separation of powers like we see in Congress, where you may have different groups that have broader input, but you need like two, two groups to kind of weigh in on things. And maybe that's a way to kind of achieve decentralized governance, but also move things along a little bit more, uh, a little bit more forward. So lots of different really exciting things. I think that's definitely next frontier. Great question. Yeah, I mean, thanks a lot for the great answers to these questions. Uh, so maybe I can ask uh, another question. So, yeah. um, Right, so I think uh, when you talk about the legal issues, a lot of it is like SEC and other, uh, like related more uh, US, I would say, um, uh, rev, uh, focused uh, uh, aspects. So can you also talk about more from the international perspective, uh, mm. the regulatory side? <laughs> yeah, you know, I for better or worse, I, I definitely think many other jurisdictions are waiting to see how the US handles things before they act. So we haven't seen a tremendous amount of enforcement actions from jurisdictions outside the US. Um, I don't know exactly why that's the case. Uh, we have seen some clarification during the token boom of 2016 to 18 about the classification of tokens. So one example is in Switzerland, SIFMA, which is the Swiss equivalent of the SEC, issued you know, fairly clear guidance just outlining under what circumstances they'll consider a token to be a security, um, you know, in what, in what instances it will not be considered a security. That was largely mirrored, you know, frankly, it's hard to parse through, but in the US, uh, there's a couple differences around the edges, but at its core, what uh, the way it landed in Switzerland was if you're selling a token and marketing it as an investment, or it has a right to some sort of profit or stream of income, it's probably, it's going to be a security, right? It looks like a financial product. If it's a utility token that's used for governance or used as a license or access or something else like that, at least in Switzerland, it's not going to be considered a security. Uh, and then there's, you know, always assets because developers are fun that blend together different things or they like kind of mutate. So they said that those should be handled on a case by case basis. You know, in many ways, that's where the US landed too. It just used a lot more words to get there, but I, I don't think it's that dissimilar here. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe that could change over the next quarter or so. Uh, Singapore is also weighed in um, and largely mirrored um, what's, what Switzerland did. Um, I'd say that those are probably the furthest along in terms of, of, of thinking and thought processes. The FATF, uh, which is this international group, again, Don, they, they've weighed in when it comes to AML and know your customer requirements. Uh, that's probably the most coordinated response that we've seen. They just came out with proposed rules in June. Uh, it's very broadly spoken, or very, it, the, the language is very broad, uh, so it's unclear who is going to be subject to some of those requirements. Um, it's a little bit too broad for, for my purposes. I, I do think that they want to you know, hold developers responsible, and I just think that that's a bad idea, but that's a little bit outside of my pay grade. Unfortunately, uh, other things I used to note, like tax, like, like tax is different in different jurisdictions than, than in the US. Um, if you are developing a project, you're going to spend some time if you get funding and are trying to develop it with lots of lawyers and, and including tax lawyers to kind of manage those risks. Um, it's tricky because if you're going to a jurisdiction for tax reasons like Panama or a Caribbean island, it sounds pretty good and you, maybe you're saving money, but wearing like a regulator's hat. And if I, and this should be plain, like if I tell you that you're like operating some business in like Panama or some ran, the Seychelles or some random jurisdiction, it kind of makes you look a little bit like a, not a good faith broker. So I, I think that's why you see like Uniswap and a lot of US uh, DeFi projects, especially in this wave, uh, just sticking in the US, right? They're not trying to avoid anything. They're standing up tall and just trying to figure out the right answers, which, which may be a right approach. Um, in other jurisdictions, though, they've clarified it. Like in Switzerland, crypt, if you're a Swiss citizen, it's amazing. Crypto to crypto transactions are not taxed. Like how amazing is that? So hu huge advantage. Uh, Singapore and other jurisdictions uh, have clarified on the tax side and are using that as a arbitrage opportunity. Uh, so lots of really interesting tax stuff. Some people geek out on the the tax the tax uh, the tax game. That is not my specialty, but that's another area where there's a bit of a difference. And I haven't seen any jurisdiction weighing on DeFi yet, uh, Don, outside of like ICOs and token sales. I may miss something. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if there are no more other questions, thank you so much, Aaron.
for yeah uh, thanks so much for having me don really appreciate it and thanks everyone for being with us for the class uh this semester and uh also i think for students who are doing class projects right the class project reports is due soon and also as we mentioned we'll be issuing an nft for completion of the project so we'll be releasing oh, right. information about the nft uh, shortly as well that's awesome i think that's great okay Super thanks cool. everyone Hey, right. thank Bye you. Down. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron.